<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Friday session of our summer school. And yes, I don't think that the Morton needs any introduction. He can just uh, continue to give us his wonderful story. Thank you very much, Morton. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ilya. Thanks for these nice words. The um, um, I just put up the chat here, so in case you have questions uh, while while I'm speaking, uh, feel also free to uh, uh, unmute yourself if you want to. Uh, there's also the book voucher, so Francesco and Ilya, they would like you to punch in your email uh, for the competition of the uh, about the best question, whatever that means. I hope they can give a book voucher to everybody who asks a question. So feel free to use the uh, the chat and ask questions while uh, we move on. Uh, the um, I also wanted to add uh, one small thing. Uh, yesterday I mentioned this, uh, not not yesterday, but on Wednesday I mentioned this uh, movie about Git and GitHub, which I made or video, and you can find the link here on the main uh, GitHub address. And I'm going to paste it into the uh, to the chat again, and it's a. Uh, it's not a great video, just to be honest. It won't give me an Oscar if we go to Hollywood. But it's, uh, it's supposed to give you a kind of overview on how to use Git and GitHub. The, um, uh, one of the reasons why I put that one is that uh, Git is a, is, a very, uh, is a very much used uh, version control software. So like the lectures here, if you have uh, downloaded the, uh, the link here to your laptop, you would simply punch in the terminal mode, or if you're using a graphical user interface, you would just write git pull, and then you will always get the latest version of the material online here. And that's the... Uh, uh, yeah, that's the uh, that's a very good question, which is in the chat here. So let me just repeat that one. So the, with the validation set, is it more important that it follows the distribution of the test set rather than the training set? So the uh, thing is that you can think of the test set as something which has been untouched. And uh, when you do machine learning, you're not that interested in a distribution or the probability distribution. So the validation is normally done on, uh, let's say if you take 80% of the data and then you uh, run 60% on training and then you would have 20% on fine tuning the hyperparameters that would be done on that set which you put aside. So it shouldn't have any connection with the test set. No, you can think of the test set as something which you keep safely in a vault, and that stays there till you want to apply the model. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do now is to repeat a little bit some of the things which we did yesterday, uh, so you can see the wood for the trees, uh, and I'm going to use the whiteboard in order to do that. And then we're going to back to uh, uh, this uh, bias variance trade-off. We're going to look at this difference between the mean squared error, since we're doing a, a regression analysis. The mean squared error is a standard uh, measure of the quality of the model which you have. You can use other functions as well. And there are many in the literature. And that they may, uh, you may actually have to come up with your own depending on the data set. But the mean squared error is the simplest one. And many of us have seen that before. So the mean squared error is normally used when you want to uh, find the optimal parameters. And then uh, what, you, uh, uh, what we are going to do is to look at also this bias variance trade-off. And we will look at resampling techniques. And after that, uh, we are going to jump into uh, regression methods for classification. And that's going to lead to logistic regression. And uh, that's roughly the plan for the day here. And if we are lucky, we may get into uh, the topic of uh, optimization because the uh, till now we have seen that we have an analytical formula, but normally we actually have to calculate these gradients which uh, appear in the calculations uh, in terms of when we are minimizing a cost function, uh, we would have to calculate them numerically. But let me jump into the whiteboard here and uh, let us repeat some of the things which we discussed on uh, on Wednesday. So uh, what we have been looking at are regression methods. 
and the type of regression methods uh, are based on us making a model and the uh, we have a data set so we would have some y and these are data points which would span from a y0 y1 this should be an equality sign so these are our data points then we have a y2 and up to the y n minus 1 and we call these for outputs or targets or the dependent variable as you may find in in other textbooks normally i will just call them the output or just the target values so these are the data points which we want to reproduce and then we have some inputs and these inputs now uh, are now given by uh, a matrix which we call the design matrix and that design matrix would now typically have some data points x0 x0 and there will be an x a 1 0 all the way down here to x n minus 1 0 and what you would have in the columns here that would be what we call a given feature and that specific column has a feature of p equal to 0 and then we have the next column where we start with the observation 0 and then we have a feature number 1 feature number 0 and then this would just go on all the way down here again to x of n minus 1 of feature 1 so if we were fitting a polynomial of a given degree the first column could be the intercept the second column could be x to the power of 1 the third column x to the power of 2 and so on and then we would have something like uh, p features to describe uh, the system if we are thinking of this cancer data which we're going to meet today finally this uh, wisconsin breast cancer data we have something like uh, 500 patients so n is equal to 500 and then the classification of these different tumors have something like 30 features one of the features is the mean radius of the tumor another one is the thickness the area of the tumor and so on which are used by pathologists to classify uh, whether this is a benign or malignant tumor and then we would have an x1 of p and all the way down here to x of n minus 1 and this should be a p minus 1 since we started the numbering uh, at 0 in order to stay with uh, the default way we define a python array so this x is now with the input data is now a matrix of dimensionality n times p then what we have so this is the data then the second thing which we have is the model and uh, we looked at the linear model so we made a model here y tilde which is now given by this matrix x times this parameters beta and beta are now the could be the parameters in linear regression so let me just see here because we have a question in the chat again yeah so that p up to p minus one gives p features so if you start from zero you run from zero up to p minus one so in total you have p features so i i do this numbering instead of starting from one up to p i start from zero to p minus one and from zero to n minus one simply because uh, since you guys have gone through these python lectures we know that the python arrays they start by default with uh, uh, element zero so we make a model uh, there's also some uh, basic assumption which we need to bring in here when we are doing linear regression there is a basic assumption about the data and we are going to lead to need this one when we look at the bias variance trade-off so the basic assumption which is made and this was actually made by gauss and laplace when they derived this equation around the 1850s i mean close to 200 years ago so there's a basic assumption here is that the data which we have this y uh, there is a mysterious function f of x which we don't know and then we assume that these functions are have an error so there's a normal distribution here so this these epsilons are distributed according to the normal distribution with zero mean value so there's a random noise which we add to the data and then there's a variance 
which in principle is unknown. So this is a basic assumption which we make uh, when we derive the uh, probability distribution for linear regression. So you're assuming that these are normally distributed. This function f of x is the one which we now approximate. So we make an approximation here. So we approx this f of x with our model, this y tilde here. So when I've... Um, when I'm not putting a subscript like y of i or x of i, I'm assuming that these are now vectors, but I'm not putting a boldface or vector sign above them. So this is a, an assumption which is made about the data itself. Uh, this uh, becomes important because you can show, and I'm not going to go through the mathematics here, but you will find information about that in either textbook or in the slides. Uh, this means that uh, when we calculate the uh, expected value for y, I mean the mean value for y, we are going to see that that's normally distributed and it has a mean value which is given by our model here, x times b, x times beta. So I just remind you this beta is now a vector of dimensionality p. So we have the data, we have the model, and machine learning is all about this. And then we have the final uh, assessment of the model. And that's where we gauge the quality of the model. And typically we define then a cost function or an error function or risk function or loss function. So I'm just going to call it the cost function. So there's some kind of, uh, you will find different namings for this quantity uh, depending on what kind of literature you look into. So if you're going into finance, this or risk analysis, then it's normally called the risk function. Uh, I tend to call it the error function, but this naming cost function, loss function is something which is pretty established in the literature. In physics, you would often find this being called the error function. And the standard one was the mean squared error, as we discussed uh, on uh, Wednesday. And uh, what we would have then is that we would have a function which depends on these parameters beta, which would then be given by the expected value, not an n, but an n. So we have n data points, and we run from i equals 0 to n minus 1, and then we have a y of i minus this y of i tilde. And clearly we want to drive this to 0. Uh, we could rewrite that in terms of a uh, matrix vector relation, so we have a y, minus this x times beta of t of y minus x times beta. And we can write this in an even more compact way. And we can write this as a, the norm, as a vector 2 norm of uh, y minus x times b. So this is a norm of a vector. So, And then since uh, this now has the square root of the sum of all the squared matrix elements. We need to put it to square it. So this is a norm 2 definition. And then what we will do next is to calculate the derivative with respect to the parameters beta. And we want to minimize that. <coughs> and when we minimize that, we get an analytical expression for these parameters beta. So we get the optimal ones when we minimize. Uh, sometimes you will see this label with a hat. In the statistic literature, that is pretty common. And that is given by the matrix X minus 1 times the transpose of this matrix times the data points. These are the, the targets we want to reproduce. So everything on the right-hand side is known. So the matrix X is known. Uh, the uh, matrix XT times X can be calculated if the inverse is easy to find. If not, we would have to use methods like the pseudo-inverse or singular value decomposition. Then, so this is a standard OLS, and that means also that our model Y is then simply, when we have this parameter, is given by beta times x times beta opt. So this is the prediction which we make at the end. Then, what we could do now is we could uh, make a, introduce additional parameters. 
So we could now look at what's called ridge regression. And then what we are minimizing is a new function. So the cost function then is C beta, and that's going to be given by the mean squared error, the same quantity which we had in linear regression. Now it's not it's not the same because the, the variance would now be if you want to calculate the variance. So let me just mention that because that's an important point. Uh, let's just uh, let me just write this one first and then I'm going to put up the expression for the variance so that I can answer your question in the chat here. But let me just put up this one first. So we have a y minus x beta. But the, the mean squared error looks almost like the variance. And then we would have the same thing as we had in ordinary least squares, but then we would optimize the parameter beta. There would be a lambda here, and then we would take the norm 2 of this beta, and we would minimize with respect to this, lambda, this beta parameters, and this lambda is a hyperparameter. So that becomes a parameter in our theory. Now, in this case, we can also find a beta optimal, and uh, that is now given by a slightly different matrix inversion problem. And this matrix is always invertible, minus 1 times xt of y. So this is ridge regression, and that's one of the uh, uh, more popular methods. And then we also had lasso regression. So in this case, we have analytical expressions. So the final one is lasso. And that does not have an analytical solution because we need to calculate the derivative of the absolute value of these parameters beta. So in lasso, we have 1 over n, the same as we had when we did linear standard ordinary least squares. But now we are optimizing with a hyperparameter where we have the norm 1 of a vector. So the norm 1 of a vector, if we take a vector here, norm 1, that is simply the sum over all the elements which we have, n minus 1, and then it's the absolute value of the element. And that leads to problems when we want to calculate the derivatives. Or well, it's not a problem. We have an analytical expression for the derivative, but that will depend that will need an if test. So we cannot uh, get a simple analytical expression because we need to have an if test in case the value is negative or positive. And uh, this normally leads to uh, something which we, if we get time, we could discuss something about convex optimization problems if we get time. Now, these methods like uh, Lasso and Ridge, what they can do for us is that they can give us, depending on this parameter lambda, they can give us a smaller mean squared error. So let me come back to the variance. So the variance, if we now look at the variance of this quantity y, so that would be a variance of y. It looks almost the same, but that would be given by y, the sum of i equals 0 to n minus 1, and then I have y of i, but I would have minus the mean value of y here. So I would have this mu of y squared, and this mu of y is the sample mean value. So that would be the sum from n minus 1 of y of i. Now, this may not be equal to the true mean value because we have a sample. So in the limit when n goes to infinity, this would approach the true mean value if you knew the probability distribution. So you see now that the, the cost function and the variance, they are almost lookalikes as you as you, as you write in the chat here, but they are not the same. So we use this uh, uh, mean squared error, which we have up here. This function is a way to gauge the difference between the uh, mean, va the, uh, the model you make and the targets. So it measures the, uh, it's a kind of measure of the difference between the quality of your model and the function you want to or the target values which you want to reproduce. So the mean value for this uh, y would be that one. And if I want the mean value of this y tilde, on the other hand, 
that will be given by 1 over n of i equals 0 of n minus 1. And then you would have a y i tilde minus y, the, mu, the mean value of y tilde. Now, when we are going to look at the bias variance trade-off, we are going to rewrite this mean squared error in terms of uh, the variance of the uh, model itself and the difference between the mean value which the model gives and the target values. So let me, let me give you this. So I'm just going to state the result. In the slides, you will find the derivation of this. So what we have assumed bias variance trade-off this is a way to measure the uh, onset of overfitting. And we are coming back to that in the Jupyter Notebook pretty soon now. So yesterday, what we saw was something like this. So we made a function of the complexity of the model. And we looked at the mean squared error here. And then we saw that when the complexity kept increasing, our training mean squared kept decreasing. Mean squared train. Because that means that we are now fine tuning a model to the training data and we just keep fine tuning it so that at the end, we basically go through all the, the points which we have in the training set. So you get a perfect fit. So you mean you can actually increase the complexity so that at the end you really fit perfectly. Uh, it may not always look like this, but normally this is what you will find. Then uh, what we did next was to make a, uh, a comparison with the uh, test model. So we will see something like this. And then suddenly the, the mean squared error for the test case started to increase. So it means that there is some somewhere, there is an optimal model. So optimal model. So that could be a, an optimal polynomial parameterization. So polynomial degree 10 would perhaps be the optimal one. So this would give you the optimal model. And then when you go up here, this is where you end into the region of overfitting. So just to explain this a little bit better, suppose now that you have some data set. So we have a data set here. And if we now look at the data set, we could think of uh, some data which looks like this. And suppose now that I make a training where I have a kind of perfect reproduction of the data. So I make a training now where I go through this data. So these are my training data. And if I have selected these, and I want to use this model to make a prediction on, let's say, this one or that one, you would fail dramatically. So you could really train a model to fit that selected set of training data but then you would have all these outliers. And that means that when you now use this model on your test set, which was not included in the training, you would fit miserably. Alternatively, you could now make a new model. So where you could now have something, uh, you could now have a model which now goes through all the data points. So you could make a model which does this for you. Like that. You would traverse all the data points. But so... But then there may be a data point which is up here. So there could be a point here which was not included. So when you apply that model to that data point, you would again fail. So these are the things you, uh, when you're setting up your model now, uh, these are the things you're looking after. So the point where the model makes the best possible prediction on the test set. So if we now go back to this bias variance trade-off, uh, you can analyze this data in a slightly different way. So we can rewrite this mean squared error in terms of the variance of the model itself and the uh, difference between the mean value 
of uh, the model with respect to the target data which you have. So let me uh, just set up the equations and then we are going back to uh, some further discussions on how we can uh, get also a better estimate for the, uh, for the errors which we have. So uh, there's one thing I wanted to bring back now before we set up the equations and that's the, the basic assumption we make when we are dealing with linear regression. So the assumption which is made is that there is a continuous function f of x which describes our data. That's the basic assumption. And we're also assuming now that uh, the uh, variable y uh, has a noise which is just normally distributed and there is a variance here, this parameter sigma, which is normally unknown. We don't know how this noise is distributed except that we assume that it is a, a normal distribution with mean value equal to zero. That's an assumption. With that assumption, you can then show, since the epsilon is normally distributed, that y will also be normally distributed. Uh, so uh, this is a small digression which I'm mentioning now. Uh, so you can actually set up a normal distribution for the y's and you can then, from that, you can then derive the same equations for the parameters beta, which we did by plain linear algebra on Wednesday. So there are two ways you can derive it. And the nice thing with linear regression is that you can then make this link with probability theory or with a statistical interpretation. So we have a basic assumption uh, when we are setting up now y that there is some kind of mysterious function f of x and we are approximating this mysterious function with our model x times beta if we are doing standard ordinary least squares. You can show that the mean value of y is equal to x times beta because the mean value of uh, epsilon is equal to zero. X is a uh, non-deterministic object, and the same is beta. So when we do machine learning normally, we are not interested in the probability distribution of beta. And we take this as a deterministic parameter because we have a deterministic equation to find the beta. And X is well defined by us. We know the inputs to our model and we simply assume that we are not interested in the probability distributions of the x's as well. So x is a non-stochastic object and beta is also a non-stochastic object. And then you can show, and you will see that as one of the exercises I put on day two, that you can uh, calculate the expected value of uh, uh, y and that's given by x times beta. So that's an important result. And you can also show that the variance of y itself is now given by the variance of these parameters sig epsilon here. So that follows from this. Now what we can do now is to rewrite the mean squared error. This should be an n of uh, y minus x times beta. So this is the mean, the mean squared error. We can rewrite that one in terms uh, so in the slides, you will find the derivation of it. You can rewrite this one now as a 1 over n. And there's a sum of i equals 0 up to n minus 1. And then you have the targets, i of i, minus the mean value of the model squared. This is called the bias in the literature and uh, it measures the difference between your target points and the mean value provided by the model which you made. Then you can rewrite this. You have an additional term which is now given by the variance of the model itself. So the trick is here in order to get this one what you're doing you're simply adding in order to get to that expression you're just adding this uh, va mean value of y 
and subtracting it. So just adding this quantity and then you can rewrite this quantity in terms of a variance. So this will be your y tilde minus y, the mu, the mean value of this one, plus this quantity sigma squared. So the quantity you see here is called the variance of the model. So that's uh, one ingredient which we are going to look at now. And uh, yes, on Wednesday, we looked at this uh, overfitting problem in terms of the difference between the mean squared error for the training set and the mean squared error for the test set. You will often see both this curve, but you will also see a curve where you now look at your test data. So you would then perform this on the test set. You have trained your model. And then you would look at this quantity in terms of the test set. And you would make a similar plot of the complexity of the model. We are going to discuss this a little bit more detail when we bring up the slides. But I wanted to bring in one more thing, one more technicality before we move on. So you would then calculate uh, the mean squared error. You would put the bias. And you would place the tra the uh, the uh, your your variance. So you could now say that you would have a curve like this. So this could be your mean squared error of the test data. Now what you would typically see at the bottom here would be a curve. When you split things, you would get a curve like this. So ideally, you have something like this. So this would be the variance which we defined above. That means this quantity which you see here. So that's the variance of the model itself. Then you would find another curve for the bias. And that would typically follow the mean squared error. And then at a certain point here where these cross. And then this would be the the so-called bias. I'm coming back to what this means or the interpretation which we can make. But what you would now see that this typically cross when you have the kind of optimal complexity here, optimal model. So my graph here should have been this blue line should have been a little bit flatter here and then it should start rising. Okay. So this is a further analysis which can be made. Now, one thing uh, which is done then to calculate the mean squared error, to calculate the best possible estimate, so remember now that uh, what you have is a limited set of data. The best possible estimate for mean squared error test. We need resampling techniques. So let's just pause a little bit. Why do we need resampling techniques? Uh, if you're not familiar with this kind of concept, uh, you will probably not be able to answer, but some of you may be familiar with that. So suppose I have on, I made a measurement and I have only, let's say, 100 data points. And this is what I have. So I'm not allowed to make a new measurement, or rather there's no possibility, because people would simply tell me the measurement uh, went on for half a year. You were running at CERN. You were doing a particle physics experiment. And uh, uh, if you run at CERN for half a year, the ele just the electricity bill will just scare, <laughs> really scare you. So CERN, for instance, goes down for maintenance from November till typically February. And there's a main reason for why they do the maintenance then, because that's during the winter, and that's when electricity prices go up. So CERN... Uh, as a as a lab has a dedicated uh, 
pipelines for high power electricity in order to run the experiments. And they consume energy at the most, which corresponds, I think somebody gave an estimate, which was half of the energy consumption of the country of Switzerland. So uh, if you run an experiment for half a year, it's very unlikely that they will allow you to make a new experiment. So suppose you now have these 100 data points. Uh, why do we introduce this concept of resampling techniques? Is there any good, good, uh, good reasons for that? Good reason for that. Any suggestion here? So I'm going to give you a hint. So the uh, uh, ways you calculate the errors, so the error estimate is given by your standard deviation, and that follows from the, from the variance, from sample variance. So you have a sample of data, and this sample variance of a given quantity, let's call this quantity just for x, the sample variance is now given by your data set of i equals 0 to n minus 1. And then you have your data points, your measurement, and then you subtract the mean value of your measurement. So this is the definition of the variance. So do you see any problems with that? So this may not be equal to the true variance. So if you know the distribution of this x, the quantity which you have may just be an approximation to the true variance. So why would we use something like resampling techniques then? Or if you're familiar with the concept, what it actually means? Any good suggestions here, early in the morning? I guess you haven't had your cups of coffee yet or cups of tea. So I need, I need a coffee to have my brain to function. And if you rush to the lectures, you probably didn't have. Yeah, it could allow us to understand just how much exactly. So the, this is a very, this is a, a good explanation. So, so the, um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with statistics. We have something which is called the law of large numbers. So if I have a small n, it means that most likely I will have an approximation which may not be close to the true value. So suppose you know that there is a probability distribution which describes the excess. You may not know that one. Now, if you can increase n, then uh, the law of large numbers uh, indicates that or tells you that uh, you should approach, when n increases, you should uh, approach the true variance. So if you have the true variance, then you can make a very reliable estimate of the error you make. So these are important things when you do machine learning. Because when we are now plotting uh, the mean squared error, the test uh, mean squared error, or this variance or the bias, we want to give you, or the people who are going to look at our model, the best possible estimate of the error. So resampling techniques are a way to generate a better estimate of uh, the error estimate. So we have popular techniques, and one of the more popular techniques is called the bootstrap. And it was introduced by Efron in 79, uh, I think. And it's a paper which has something like 20,000 citations. So the bootstrap is very simple. You can show mathematically that when you take the limit of many such bootstraps is that you then really approach the true variance for independent and identically distributed variables, stochastic variables. So the approach here, the algorithm is very simple. And that's why it's so well cited. So you would start by reshuffle your data randomly. So you do a one, resample your data sample y and x 
your data randomly with replacement. So that means that you can actually, so if you have a data set now, which originally is now given by, so you have a data set in here. So let's write this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now you can reshuffle this one. So this is your original data set. Now you reshuffle and then you produce a new data set. So this could now be two. But then since you're putting it back again, you could have two in here. Then you could have three. You could have seven. Then you could have five. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven slot. Two, three, four, five. So then we would have two more slots here. So you could have a four here and then you could actually get a one here. Now, what happens with this method is you can actually get the same measurement again. So you resample, then you calculate these uh, uh, things like the mean squared error. And then you repeat. So let's call this mean squared error 1. Then you repeat and you do this n times. And every time you reshuffle your data and you uh, produce then a new mean squared error. So the final step then is that your final mean squared error is now simply 1 over m and then the sum from 0 to 1 up to this m minus 1. I should actually rewrite this one as a 0 here. And then I would have a sum over this ms. So this should be a y here, a y. So this would be your final mean squared error, or the variance, or the mean, or the mean squared error, if you're looking after that one. So a resampling technique, uh, and you can actually show this mathematically, that this is a technique like bootstrap, which gives you the correct mean squared error or the correct variance, if you know now the distribution, and if you have the, uh, uh, the, the uh, so-called independent and identically distributed stochastic variables. There is also a, uh, a variant for the bootstrap for events which are not identically distributed and independent of each other. So this independent means simply that you can take the likelihood for one event and just multiply it with all the other ones. So this should be I, yeah, this should be, sorry for that, I, I should clean up a little bit. Thanks for pointing this out. So it starts with zero, since I'm insisting on starting the arrays with zero. Okay, so this is the bootstrap, and it's extremely simple. And in Python, this uh, thing which you have here, this one, there is a function which is just called resample, and that uh, follows in with scikit-learn. So to implement the bootstrap is something which uh, is very, very simple, and we are going to look at the example here. The other method, which is widely used in producing a better estimate of the errors, or the mean squared error, the variance, or the bias, or quantities like that, is something which is called cross-validation. So what I should uh, uh, also say here is that for every case here, you make a training. And with that training, so you would train on this data here, train. And then with that training, you make a prediction. So the mean squared error, which we have here, is now the mean squared error for the test case. So this is the test mean squared error. So we train on the resample data, and then with that one, we make a prediction for the model, and then we calculate the mean squared error. So that's the test all the time. So this is always test. So we produce a better test error. Now, before we take a break now, I just wanted to mention cross-validation. Uh, so we're not going into all the proofs, the statistical proofs. I'm just uh, taking a more practical point of view 
and explaining to you the algorithms without giving you the mathematical proofs. So I hope you can forgive me for that. So cross-validation, so suppose now you take your data set. This is a little bit different from the bootstrapping. So in the, in the bootstrapping, you would now take your data set, split it in train and test, and then you just leave your test set outside. So the test set stays the same through all the bootstraps, all the resamplings. So this uh, test set, which you see now, is always the same. So you have performed, before you start the bootstrap, you have in here, you do a train test split. And you do that once. So your test data stays there in the vault and it's untouched. Now the cross validation on the other hand is a little bit different. So you could now define something which is called a K, a K5. So you were taking your data. So let's take the data which we have. And then what you would do now is to split the data in five folds. So this is called K folds. So I would now split my data into five slots. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, what I would do now is in every iteration, I would, so this would be my first iteration. And then I calculate, so I would say now that uh, this is train, train, train. So the first one is train set. And the final one is my test set. And then I compute mean square error on this set 5. Next, what I do now is I say now that in the five slots here, what I do is now that my, this will be my train, but now I would have this one as a test. So this will be my test. So I train on slots one, two, three, and five, and then I compute the mean square error of four. So this is 4. Then I repeat, and you see the pattern now. So I'm going to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you would have train would be the green ones. And then I take the mean squared of 3. So this is my train set. Uh, the train set uh, are still the four boxes, but the test set keeps changing. And then I would continue like this to the last one. So my final mean squared error would then be the mean squared error of 1 plus the mean squared error of 2 and all the way up to the mean squared error of 5. And then in this specific case I would have to divide by 5 here. So what you will typically see is that this k takes values between 5 to 10 you can actually end up with something which is called leave one out cross validation. In that specific case, what you would do then is just to rerun this n times if these are the data sets. That means you would just take out one at each time and use that as your test set. So these are the two most used methods for calculating a better estimate of the mean squared error for the test data. Uh, they are different in philosophy in the sense that the, in the cross-validation, the test set keeps changing. Now, this splitting in your data with cross-validation is done automatically in uh, uh, scikit-learn. And we are going to look at how to do that uh, numerically after the break now. Uh, no, because the, the, uh, there's a question in bootstrapping. So the okay. test set stays always the same here. So that's, that's unchanged. So uh, every time now, what I do, I, I fit a model to data which has been reshuffled, and then I make a prediction then on the same test set all the time. So that's really unchanged.
it's never changed. So I just keep that up here and then I just call it back when I now want to calculate the mean squared error which I use to calculate the average mean squared error. So the mean squared error here is only done on the test set. So uh, we're going to take a small break now and after the break we're going to look at the codes and then we're going to see how we can implement these things. So because these are important aspects when we are running machine learning calculations. And cross-validation is one of the algorithms which is widely used. And I will show you how you can do that in, your, in, the, in the different slides here. Should we take a small break and just meet back at uh, 11? Would that be okay for everybody? No, at, at, uh, at 10 for everybody? 10, 10 o'clock South African time, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, 10 o'clock South Yeah, thank yeah. you, Martin. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to stop sharing. And then after the break, we are going to look at the the codes here. And guys, feel free to ask questions in, in, in the break now. Uh, fill in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, do that. Because I'm going to bring back that one. Sorry, Martin. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the question is about uh, your kind of the, your fitting of the parameters with the Weizsäcker model, yeah, which you use for the for the example. Like, but if I also want to fit that pairing terms, which is kind of non-polynomial, but which is like plus constant, zero or no constant, how yeah. you would uh, encode that into the into your model? Um, so. I, so is, is that no I, I which which example were you thinking of was that the the nuclear binding energies yeah 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 the nuclear binding energy so because yeah. you you kind of don't take into account that uh, yeah. the last pairing term which is traditionally yeah. textbooks yeah how yeah. would you take that into account because then you would have to bake in explicitly the uh, dependence on uh, the number of neutrons and protons so you would mm -hmm. simply in your model then you would have a uh, additional term where you would plug in number of neutrons minus protons as, as an explicit parameter. So you would in the, uh, uh, so what I didn't do, if I, if I now go back to the, uh, let me go back to the slides here. Uh, if we do that on, uh, yeah, I think we have it. Let me just scroll down a little bit here. And because I have an easier page to look at. So the kind of, uh, uh, model which we did like here this is the way I did it right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't care about the number of protons and neutrons if you now go back to day one and you look at the uh, the standard way it's done uh, if you now scroll down a little bit so I did it in a very brute force way so let me just bring it down here uh, I have some yeah, so 
Well, let me just bring this down. So what I would need to plug in would just like in this term I would have z and I know the value of z and then I have n minus z squared so this could also be rewritten as uh, a minus the number of neutrons if you want to. Uh -huh, yes of course. So you would plug, so what I did was just a slightly lazier variant so I didn't bring in the number of protons and the number of neutrons so you would simply include that in the models here. Yeah, but but also if I want to have that the one more term, which is the parent yeah. term, which is for yeah. odd odd even even odd yeah. even nucleuses. Right, right, right. So then then you would have an explicit dependence on n and sets. So in that sense, this kind of fitting in terms of a may not be the best one. Maybe you would need to fit it in term with, as a function of n and set here. Mm -hmm. So you would have to think of a of a perhaps a different polynomial fit because the pairing term it has also an n and z dependence so that means that you would not have this explicit a dependence there if i don't remember wrongly so the the uh, yeah uh, i haven't looked into that but i could take a look into it because the uh, what i did with this model uh, once was to plug in the uh, number of neutrons and number of protons Okay, okay. No, no, no. I say I, I just generic interest because, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was teaching the, thir uh, the third year students and I was teaching yeah. them introduction to the nuclear and particle physics. Right. And I was right. thinking that I might use your codes as oh, yeah, a demonstration. Please. No, please do that. I mean, th this material is meant to be used and reused. Uh, the uh, uh, so the I only need to look up the pairing model. I don't remember exactly how it was parameterized in terms of number of neutrons and protons, but I know that it appears in the liquid drop model. Yeah. yeah. So the uh, let me look it up here because I, I I never venture into that. The only thing I did was to change uh, uh, the fit by adding the number of neutrons and protons. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Also, there's a question in the chat here. A few pages back, when you define it looked to me like they were the same equation okay let me just bring it up here so i could rather bring let me bring this one back and then i have the bias variance here let's just go down and look at the bias there's a question in the chat here yeah i can yeah, yeah. i can and look you, this up and in we there. can probably start go okay thank you and we can probably start kind of going back to the matter of the today's lecture yeah because it's 10 o'clock, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to say there's a question in the chat here about the, the bias variance trade-off. So I have the um, uh, resampling, let me just bring that down. There's a lot of material here and I don't have the time to go through everything. Uh, so the um, uh, so this would be the expectation value. Uh, I just rewrite this as expectation. This is the mean squared error which you have defined. Okay, in the handwritten notes. Okay, I'm going to check that one because the hopefully what's written in the slides should be correct. Or maybe there was a definition here which looked a little bit clumsy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, let's now take the uh, uh, since we're beginning again now. Let's now look at the what we did yesterday. So yesterday we had a simple example where we wanted to fit a polynomial of degree 18 to this function which you have here. So it's uh, the exponential of minus x squared plus some additional terms and some random noise here. And then we want to fit a polynomial. So obviously the random noise is going to play an important role here. And what we did then was simply to run through the uh, polynomial degree. We make the uh, splitting of the data. So we keep the test set. And then we uh, train uh, the, uh, the, the model and we use that one to make a prediction as a function of the model uh, which we have chosen. Now in this case here we don't do any resampling. So here this model has no resampling. So that means that most likely our estimate no resampling our estimate of the mean squared errors may not be the best ones. Now, in the next example, uh, so what we got was something like this. So this was a training for the mean squared error and the training for the test data. 
But let's now look at uh, how we can do a bootstrap. So here I'm taking a kind of uh, exaggerated case and normally the number of bootstrap is seldomly uh, taken to be larger than the data set. But now I'm starting with 40 data points and I resampled this a hundred times. So scikit-learn has a function which does the resampling for us and it's just called resample. So that easy. You can do it yourself. Uh, that's no problem. So we take the same function. So we have an x from minus 3 to 3 and uh, we take a y which is now given by the same function. We have the polynomial degrees. I calculate my mean squared error. This is the error, the bias, variance. And I do now my train test split. So that's unchanged. And then what I do next now is that I uh, make my model, but then I have a loop over the bootstraps. So I'm doing this 100 times. So for every bootstrap, I resample my train data, as you see here. So that's being resampled. And uh, this is a functionality which you have in scikit-learn. You could do it yourself, there's no problem, but when you have this functionality, use it. So now I'm performing the bootstrapping, the basics of the bootstrapping. And then I make a prediction. And then as you see here, this runs over all the bootstraps. So if I do this 100 times, I've made 100 predictions. Then when I'm done with this loop, I am now calculating the mean squared error with 100 bootstraps. I do the bias and I do the variance. And now I want to look at how these behave. And when we look at the plot down here, so I just run it here, what you see now is the following. So let's just keep this text here. So you see now that this bias, which is the difference between your target values and the mean value of your model, uh, they follow each other in the beginning. And then at a certain point, this bias just keeps going down. Whereas what happens is the variance of your model starts increasing. So what, is, what does this actually mean? So this bias variance trade-off is another way to look at this overfitting. So clearly what we would say now is at the complexity level of 10, we are entering a region of overfitting. Uh, before we move on to our analysis here, let's just go back to the, uh, so we had 40 data points. Let's go back to this model here and see if that kicks in here as well. So let's just rerun this one and just do the train tests split and not do a resampling. So if we rerun this model, we see now that, uh, okay, around 10, there seems to be an increase here. But in this case, we have calculated the mean squared error only once. We didn't do a resampling. So the hope with resampling is that you're getting a better estimate of the errors. And in this specific case, with these 40 data points, we see now that uh, things start to kick in around 10 here. So what it means is that this takes into account it's a balance between the complexity of the model and the amount of training data which is needed to train it. Now, since data is limited, then it's often useful to use a less complex model with a higher bias. So it means that if you have a less complex model, your mean value from the model may deviate from the target points. And, and that's what you see in the data set here. So it means that the model which has asymptotic performance is a little bit worse than another model because it's easier to train and less sensitive to sampling noise. So these equations, they tell us that in order to minimize the expected error, you need to select a statistical learning method that simultaneously achieves a low variance and a low bias. The variance is a non-negative quantity. The squared bias is also negative. So that means that you would expect that the test MSE can never lie below the variance of uh, this irreducible error. So the variance refers to the amount by which our model would change if we estimate it using a different training data set. And since the training data sets are used to fit the statistical learning method, different training sets 
will result in a different estimate. Ideally, the estimate for the model should not vary too much between training sets. However, if a method has a high variance, then small changes in the training data can result in large changes in the model. So in general, more flexible statistical methods have higher variance. And this is what you see in this graph here. So let's now go back and change the number of training sets. So let's now look at, suppose now we increase that one and we go to, let's say 400 and we just rerun. So it takes a little bit more time, but I mean, it's pretty fast in general. And now you see the following. You see now that the variance stays flat. So there is quite some sensitivity to the data set. And this bias follows basically the error which I have. So here, everything seems to be pretty flat. So since I come from a country with mountains like Norway, and uh, we have a neighboring con country which is called Denmark, which is just dead flat. The highest mountain is 150 meters. We used to say that this flat line looks like Denmark seen from the sea. Now the Danes call normally the Norwegians for the for the uh, mountain people or the mountain monkeys. That's what they normally call us. That was a digression, guys. So the um, uh, if I now increase the max degree here and rerun it, so we can take a polynomial of degree 30. And now we increase the complexity of the model. It's taking a little bit more time to calculate. So, but it it's, can be done decently fast. So what you would see now, let's go up here. So it took a little bit more time. We should have the graph pretty, oops, sorry guys. And now you see something different. And now the uh, till a complexity, so I have more data, I can increase the complexity of the model. And what you see now is that the, these quantities are pretty flat, but then now when I get to a model of degree 25, then the variance keeps increasing. In textbooks, you will see these as nice smooth curves, but that never takes happens when you're dealing with real data. So this is one of the other ways by which you would typically analyze uh, the data. Yeah, normally that, that is what you have. The more data, the better the accuracy. But what you want when you, when you deal with machine learning is to strike a balance between, you want to have a low bias, you want to have a low variance, but at the same time, you don't want to have a model which is too complex. Because if it's too complex, it requires a lot of CPU cycles to train. So in linear regression, this, uh, the case which you saw now is a vanilla case. It's a very simple model. We have very few features. We have, uh, in that last case, we had 30 features. We have a polynomial of degree 30. If I were to use uh, neural networks and I would have some more complex data set, this could take much more time. So what you're trying always is to find a kind of balance between this bias and variance. You want to have both low, but at the same time, you don't want to increase the complexity of the model so that your training becomes too complicated. So there's always this kind of balance which you uh, are looking after. So this uh, summary here tells you a little bit about the trade-off in, uh, in the process which you're doing. And if you add many of these hyperparameters, you would actually have to rerun many more calculations to find the best hyperparameters. So let me uh, look at another example, which is from, uh, uh, which, which also illustrates parts of these things. So there's a function which is cosine, uh, a simple cosine function, which I now want to fit. And I have 30 samples and I'm going to test polynomials degree one, four and 15. And if you look at that case, uh, this is something which you will see then. So the degree one, you see now that the, the samples uh, and the model, I mean the model which you make, is not the best one. When I have a degree 4, that's a typical example of a model which does pretty well in reproducing the data. But then when I went to degree 15, 
you see now that I have a model which tries to go through all the data points. This model with degree 4 polynomial goes through, doesn't go through all the points, but it seems to be given a better reproduction. And you can see that the mean squared error here is 10 to the minus 2. Uh, with a polynomial degree 1, it's 10 to the minus 1, as you see. But then, when I go to a polynomial degree 15, uh, I'm just really, really overfitting here. So I'm going f I have a training case which does a perfect job, but the function itself gives a horrible overfit when I would use that one on data which was not included. So it's this kind of balance uh, which you always have to try to strike when you deal with machine learning. Now, one of the things I wanted to bring back then is the cross-validation case. So if you go up a little bit, I can show you how you can run a cross-validation calculation, which is another method which is widely used in machine learning. So what you see now is an example where I take a slightly simpler function. So I have a hundred uh, data samples. Uh, I produce a hundred random distributed points according to the normal distribution. You see the n here. And then I simply define a function which has x squared plus some random noise. And then I define a polynomial feature, degree 6. Uh, I now introduce, because I want to do ridge regression, so I'm going to introduce parameters lambda, which now goes from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the 5. And then I do cross-validation. So one thing you see here now is my own version of cross-validation. So, But what I'm using is a function which is included in uh, uh, scikit-learn, which is called k-fold. So that does the splitting for me. It finds the way to split the data. And then I also define that the scores for a given fold. I just initialize that one. So I have a, a function of these uh, hyperparameters lambda. So this is ridge regression now. And what I'm doing now is to run a loop over these lambdas. And what people normally would do then is to do some kind of parameter search for the lambda value, which gives you the best mean squared error. And now I am producing my prediction, my mean squared error uh, for the training set using cross-validation. So I would now start the training of the indices from the test in indices and then in this k-fold split. So scikit-learn has a functionality here. So here I'm actually uh, doing this, the setup of the data myself. But below you will see a function where you can replace all these statements here with just one line. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, the behavior may change. So the reliability is something you would have to define from case to case. So there is no kind of uh, a predetermined answer what is the best model for the data. So you would fit to the data which you have. And then in, if you in your future, if you have new data which you would like to add, then you would most likely have to rerun the, the, uh, the regression analysis. So the reliability of the model is the way it behaves on data which has not been included in the training. That's the, that's the only thing you can do, actually. So the, uh, it, it's actually a, a very much uh, you trying out things again and again. And like you see here, I'm now running for these hyperparameters and ridge regression over a large swath of parameters. Now here I do the setting up of the train and the test set. But then below you will see how you can do that with scikit-learn. So you can simply set up the folds. In this case I decide that I have five slots and I keep changing because I have to run over the, the folds which I have and, and do the uh, and find the mean squared errors. And then uh, here I simply calculate my, uh, my mean squared error. This is what I calculate here on the test data. So I make a prediction here. That is with the ridge regression. The, um, uh, what you can do then uh, is also to use scikit-learn. So you can actually replace what I did. So you have defined the k-folds. Uh, but then what you would do then, instead of doing all these things which I did here, like here, you would simply use this cross 
validation score. And then you transfer your ridge estimate. Uh, you get back your ridge estimate. And then you simply calculate the, uh, the estimated mean squared false, which is a function, which is a, an output, which we get from scikit-learn. So that gives you the mean squared error. So it does everything for you. So everything which I coded by hand here, here, is simple and down to the scores, is actually done by this simple statement which you see here. And then I, I just need to make a loop over these parameters lambdas. So scikit-learn has this functionality built in. I have this bad habit that I want to write my own stuff. And I guess that most of you may have the same habit. I think that's a healthy habit. But at the same time, you can then compare with scikit-learn uh, whether what you're doing is correct or not. And then I'm just plotting. And if we run this code here, what you would see then is the following. So uh, let me rerun it. Here we are. Oops, I just pressed two times on the same thing. So the um, what you see now is that scikit-learn agrees with my own code. And you see now that this, according to this function lambda, there is a mean squared error here, which has a minimum. So what typically people do now is that they search this space of hyperparameters, and then they would, okay, they would say that for this hyperparameter, I have a, the best possible mean squared error. And I would use, this is the model which I re would recommend you to use. So this is a kind of uh, uh, back and forth you will be doing. Uh, you see now you have a hyperparameter in lambda, but the number of folds you make is also hyperparameter. And the result may actually change as the number of folds which you make. If you do a 10, uh, you could perhaps get an even better result. So we could try to rerun this one with just k folds equal to 10. So let's do that and see what happens. That may change the results a little bit. So we don't know. And these are things which uh, you would simply have to, uh, to try out when, you, when you're uh, running your calculations. You see now it changed totally, right? So we have a, a pretty flat region here where the mean squared error, so in the previous case, the best mean squared error was two. But now with k uh, folds equal to 10, I have a region which is just really flat here. And then it starts increasing. So I would say that these hyperparameters in this region here are those which I should choose. So this is the kind of things which stresses people because you see that there are many, many parameters, but you have to make such a search. So uh, in general, machine learning ends up being you tuning the best possible parameters. And the important thing, the important message which I want to give you is that uh, when you train a model, uh, you actually have to try out all these different things. And at the end, what you're doing is you're tuning lots of parameters to get the best possible fit for a, with a given model. So I hope you see this, uh, uh, all these kinds of uh, uh, small balances which you have to do here. Now what you will find here are uh, additional uh, examples. So one of these is the uh, uh, nuclear uh, binding energies for infinite uh, neutron star matter, uh, where we now perform scikit-learn and do a cross-validation and look at different polynomial degrees. So this is actually the, uh, the same example with now the, uh, uh, the uh, resamplings which we did. So I have a, this is a first just a plain example. Uh, where we now just make a plain fit of the data. So we do this train test. And uh, if we do just a train test, you see on this data here, that if I have a polynomial with up to, let's say, 7, 8, degrees 7, 8, for the den as a function of the density, that's where we now start getting a test error, which starts increasing. You could do the same example with cross-validation. Uh, and in, in that case, what you would see now is something which, uh, uh, where you have a test error now which dips down as a function of the polynomial degree. Uh, and that goes down. So this is now my uh, cross-validation case. I do five folds. I have split my data into test and 
and, uh, and train. And then I get something which runs like this on the test data. You can do cross-validation with the reach and many of these other things here. So this is the function which we had previously where we did the bootstrap. And you can rerun that one with a K fold and you would have a parameters of lambdas from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the 5. And then you would have five folds and you would train that same function and you would see that there would be a, a dip down here where you have the optimal mean squared error with that level here. So this concludes uh, the uh, standard fitting of a continuous function with the regression methods. And now we are going to move into uh, the next topic. And that is the topic of uh, classification. Uh, do we have any questions now before we move into what should have been the topic for day two? So you can play around with many of these examples, use them as you want. Uh, the aim here is to show you how you have to fine tune many of these parameters here. And that's the, uh, at the end, you end up with a, uh, a set of parameters which needs to be tuned in order to obtain the best possible mean squared error, which is a kind of measure we have chosen for fitting these functions. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, switch topic and we are going to look at uh, classification problems. So let's just bring up the slides here because they have a slightly better f reading format and we are going to continue. So you normally they're called hyperparameters. Uh, so when I say parameters and hyper because you have uh, uh, in this case you have the, the number of folds becomes a parameter Normally, we reserve the word hyperparameter to like uh, the lambda parameter, which is used in ridge and lasso regression. Uh, some people tend to call everything hyperparameters or just parameters. So when I say parameters, I'm just thinking of all the different variables which you can fine tune in order to get the best possible mean squared error. So sometimes I just say parameters. Uh, it's this is a kind of a gliding transition between using hyperparameters and parameters. So, uh, if we now look at linear regression, what we did, that uh, has been centered on finding the coefficients of a functional in order to be able to predict the response of a continuous variable on some unseen data. And the fit to this continuous variable is based on some independent variables x of i. And then linear regression gave us analytical expressions, like in standard linear regression or ridge, in terms of matrices to invert. And uh, if you can invert the product of these design matrices or feature matrices, then linear regression gives a simple recipe for fitting our data. So that's pretty nice. However, uh, if you're thinking of classification problems, then you have not a continuous function you want to fit, or continuous variables, but you would have discrete variables. So if you're concerned with outcomes taking the form of discrete variables, which is the classical classification problems, you may, for example, on the basis of DNA sequencing for a number of patients, you may like to find out which mutations are important for certain disease, or based on scans of various patients' brains, uh, figure out whether there's a tumor or not. Or if you have given a specific physical system, you would like to identify its state. You would like to identify whether it's an ordered or disordered system. So people have actually used that one to simulate phase transitions in physical systems based on tons of simulations. Or you would like to classify the status of a patient, whether the patient has a stroke, or not, a heart attack, or something else. Uh, so the most norm common case you encounter is uh, that of two possible outcomes. That would be a binary case. So the binary outcome, like true, false, positive or negative, success or failure, is a very common classification problem. And this is something which now you would like to uh, try to describe in a way, so if we want to use linear regression, let's now take a look at uh, a data set. 
So let me just bring up a data set here. So what you have here is a very simple example. So this is a, an example of data on heart disease as a function of the age. So in the code here, what I do now is to plot whether a person has a heart disease or not as a function of the age of that patient. So there is a file uh, which is um, called coronary heart disease data, CVS. And what I'm doing now is I'm setting up, I'm using now pandas again and I'm reading the CSV file, so this is a comma-separated file. So it has the ID of the patient, the age, the age group. So I classify people according to age groups from 20 to 24 years, uh, 30 to 35, and, and so on. And then whether that patient has a heart disease or not. So if you look at the plot now, so let's take a quick look at it. So what you see now, these are the age groups. So the, uh, uh, in this uh, given age group, uh, we have something like 100 patients. So this is the age. You see the first age group uh, is one, is people from age 20 to 29. And here I have very few cases. And then when I look at the higher age group, the last one, you see that there are more cases of heart disease. So if I make the distribution now, it looks like this. And you see now that they have two discrete values, 0 and 1. So suppose now that uh, you got so convinced that linear regression is such a fantastic thing. If you now want to f use linear regression to fit this, what kind of problem would you face now? So if I, may, I could use linear regression here and try to fit the data. So what kind of uh, problem would you end up with if you were to use linear regression for a classification problem? So you have discrete values here, 0 and 1. Any good suggestions? I mean, if I make a linear fit to this data, what would you see then? So would the... Uh, would the function be limited to positive values only? Or could it also take negative values if I make a fit to this data set? Any good ideas? So you say, if I make a fit, uh, are you sure about that? That it would take only one value if you think of a linear fit? Or if you... Uh, if you take a, if you make a linear fit, yeah, one side, yeah, yeah. But if you think of a linear fit, you would get a line which goes from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity, right? So you could try to fit the data, but when you use linear regression, you would not be limited to zero and one only, but you would have a continuous set of values. So that means that what you would get then would be, if, uh, if I make a linear fit, it would be a line which go, takes negative values and it takes large positive values. It could, it could go through the data points, but I would also have uh, predictions for points which are just totally irrelevant. So uh, if, you, if you now plot a fit to this function, you would now see that it most likely would also take negative values. If you take a straight line through the data set, that's what you would get. Now, another thing you could do now, you could make a fit uh, according to age group, like this. Now, in this case, you're getting a kind of, uh, I'm plotting the, uh, the mean value for each age group. Now, this looks more like a kind of S-shaped function. And what we would like to have now is that if I make a linear regression fit, that could take a value from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, if we, however, uh, would let this f, this function here, so this is with a given x, I get y. If that's be represented by the mean value, uh, what we could do then is to constrain the function to take values between 0 and 1. 
So you could now say that the function should be constrained to take these values. So we may get something like a probability distribution. So one function, which we are going to encounter next week, and now we should stop, is something like the logistic regression, not the log logistic function. So you see now that the, when I take the uh, mean value for each age group, this looks more like an S-shaped function. And I could try to fit this function instead of the data here. So what I would like to do now is to have a function which I can use as a probability. Yeah, now the equation I'm using in the regression model, that varies a little bit from uh, model to model. So I've been changing the, uh, the regression examples. I mean, I, I don't always use the same function. That's correct. That's a correct. Yeah, so the, uh, I have different examples because I, I simply just want, didn't want to use the same example again and again. But the thing I want to have you with me now is that the whole concept of making a fit uh, with linear regression, that would give us a function which could take values from plus infinity to minus infinity. Whereas now I want to be constrained between 0 and 1. So one function which does this is now what's called the logistic function. And this behaves like a probability. So this P of T now, if you take this function, could be the probability of 1. If I take 1 minus P of T, that could be the probability of getting 0. So these functions here now are the functions which we are going to try to fit. So one thing is the sigmoid function like this. And you see that this is something which, if we go up a little bit here, that's something which could traverse the data here. Then, if you also look at another possibility, is the step function. One reason why we don't use the step function is that that gives us discontinuous derivatives. Uh, another function which could be used is a tan h function. And you see that one if in case I have values which go from minus 1 to plus 1 instead of 0 to 1, I could say I want minus 1 and plus 1. And then you would say that, okay, if uh, uh, I am below, let's say, 0, then I just give the value minus 1. If I am above 0, it takes the value of plus 1. So what you could do now is to make a fit in terms of a probability. So we are now replacing our function, this model which we had, which was given by the design matrix with P, we are now replacing that one, the function, with a probability distribution. Because now we want to have events which are typically 0 and 1, a binary case. So this is a model for a binary case. And you see the probability here, if I sum up the two probabilities, they are normalized to 1. So I have only two events. So I'm going to try to make a model now, which instead of having a continuous function I want to fit, I'm going to introduce a probability. And that's the essence of uh, logistic regression. And it's normally based on the logistic function or the sigmoid. That means this function here. And that's going to take some arguments. And these are the arguments we want to fit. And that's why it's also called logistic regression, but because it mimics the way we do standard linear regression. So I was hoping actually to go through the basics of logistic regression today, but we would have to defer that one to, uh, uh, to, next, to next time, next Tuesday. And then we are going to use logistic regression as a stepping stone towards neural networks. And so we will, in the first hour on, uh, on Tuesday, we are going to look at the derivation of logistic regression, and then we move into neural networks. Okay, I'm going to stop here now. Thank you very much for the very nice lecture. And now you have a tough job because now you need to, out of the all questions which were in the chat, you need to choose the best one. <laughs> How many brochures do you have? Because, uh, I don't know how many vouchers Francesco had. I think we should give one to each here, right? <laughs>
I'm happy to support it, but Francesco might don't don't agree with me, so I'm afraid that we'll have to choose one. <laughs> since, since he since he is away, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's the price he pays for being away. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I think the um, uh, one of the questions. So you want me to choose one? Yes, of course. So I think the uh, the question which Khaled has here on how we can know the limitation of the obtained regression model, that's a very important question. Because that goes really to the heart uh, of uh, all these models here. Okay, okay, very good. Halit, uh, can you please uh, type your email so that I can forward this information to Francesco, that he can organize the book voucher for you. I think also th there's also a very good question at the end here. Uh, is there a model that one can use to incorporate the degree of the outcome? For instance, the severity of the tumor. And that's actually, uh, uh, when you go to uh, uh, this type of classification problems, uh, with convolutional neural networks uh, and imaging, because what you would have would be the uh, scans of different types of tumors. And... Uh, uh, the Chinese company Alibaba and many, many other ones, they have developed very sophisticated convolutional neural networks algorithms in order to classify uh, the types of tumors. And uh, it, they are so refined that they basically are capable of seeing uh, which tumor is a benign one or which one is a malign one, malignant one. Uh, the, the cases where you are in doubt, that's where the pathologist would have to enter and look at the scans. But this is convolutional neural networks and are standard models for imaging because you have images of scans and that's where they are used. Uh, there's huge applications there actually. Okay, okay. Very good. Uh, yeah, I think we can probably stop here. I take a note of the Khaled's email address, so I will forward this information to Francesco. And yes, I assume that I'm going to see everyone who is interested in computational fluid dynamics at two o'clock of South African time. Thank you very much, Martin. Thanks, guys, eh? and have a good weekend. And enjoy Ilya's lectures. They're also fantastic. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend.